Good morning and welcome to this, the 15th meeting of the Equality and Human Rights Committee. Can I make the usual request that mobile phones are switched on uh, to airplane mode or switched off, please? Um, we have not received any apologies for the meeting this morning and Annie Wells will be joining us uh, imminently. Um, I, agenda item one this morning is to take agenda item three in private. Are committee content to do that? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, agenda item two is um, our continuation of um, our uh, inquiry on school bullying and some of the other aspects of uh, issues affecting gyp gypsy travellers in Scotland. Um, that will be our main focus of our business today. So with us this morning, can I welcome back to committee Chris Oswald. Chris uh, is from the Equalities and Human Rights Commission. Welcome back. Um, Michelle Lloyd, who is a project manager from MECOP. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you for coming along. And uh, Maureen Finn, who is the director of STEP, which is the Centre for Mobile Cultures and Education. Maureen, we're really grateful for you being here this morning because I think we're very interested in the work that you're doing and we're very interested in the work that, that everyone's doing this morning. So this is about a scoping session on, on Gypsy Travels. It's a follow-up from the work that the previous Equal Opportunities Committee had conducted and it's a look into maybe some of the aspects of their current inquiry on uh, school bullying. So a few topics to cover there this morning, but I'm sure that, that we can get through them all um, th this morning. We're very keen to hear from you. Chris, I know that you've got something specific to say on the Planning Act. Um, so what I, what I was going to do was, uh, was give you all a couple of minutes each to tell us a wee bit about your interest in these aspects of the work. Maybe you can address the planning issue in your opening remarks, Chris, and do that for everyone. And then we can come in with questions. Are you, are you comfortable with that? Yeah? Excellent. Chris, if I can start with you. Okay, um, thanks very much for inviting us again to talk about Gypsy Travellers again um, in front of the uh, Quality and Human Rights Commission uh, Committee. Um, as I'm sure the committee will be aware, the Quality and Human Rights Commission is the, UK, is the GB regulator for equality and deals with the reserved issues of human rights in Scotland, sharing our remit um, on human rights with the Scottish Human Rights Commission. Um, over the years, we've been very supportive of the committee's inquiries. Um, there's been a number of very pertinent recommendations have been made. Um, unfortunately, I think over the life of this committee and certainly over the life of my engagement with Gypsy Traveller issues, which has been about 20, 25 years, we have seen very, very little progress. Um, the census estimates that there are around four to 5,000 gypsy travellers in Scotland, most community estimates would place that as about being 20,000. I think the committee would be familiar about issues of non-disclosure amongst gypsy travellers. Um, if you were to conceptualise those 20,000 people as living in a town, we're talking about a town where the size of Alloa, Renfrew, Dumbartonshire um, or Elgin. And that town would have the worst outcomes in terms of health, uh, in terms of employment, in terms of poverty, in terms of educational attainment. Um, but because of the, the nature of the community, the dispersed and mobile nature of the community, we don't tend to focus on those things as a group. Um, but if we were to conceptualise the community as a town, we would be looking at one of the worst towns in Scotland. Um, I'd also just return back to the very root of this, um, which is about prejudice. And just to unpack that, it's about prejudging people. And it's something that's in the run up to this conversation, I had a conversation with Michelle about this, and it is something about almost all I need to know about you is that you're a gypsy traveller. Um, you're a gypsy traveller who's older or disabled or a woman or a mother. But the, the label, the tag um, is very potent. From our own work, um, we estimate that something like we're looking for something like three football pitches worth of land in Scotland to be able to create adequate and appropriate site provision for gypsy travellers. And we don't believe that that is an impossible ask. But what we do see is that in the planning processes in Scotland, there is um, enormous difficulty in getting planning permission for local authority or private sites, it very often attracts very active campaigning from local residents and very often is supported by councillors and elected members. And in many ways, uh, I would view the essential problem as being one about land and one which is um, politicians in Scotland of all parties have been unwilling or unable to address. In terms of a proposal, um, and a, forgive me for taking a little bit of time to, to explain this. Um, three years ago, the Scottish Government did some 
internal research which uh, suggested that there were about 750 pitches across Scotland. Um, and this is a survey that they did of all local authorities. 13 local authorities in Scotland have no provision whatsoever. Uh, now, three of those are island communities where there, we would expect less provision, but we still have 29, of, uh, 10 out of 29, uh, sorry, 13 out of 29 um, local authorities where you would expect provision to be where there is no provision, and that's particularly concentrated in the west of Scotland. But of the 750 or so identified pitches across Scotland, two-thirds of those are inside two local authority areas, South Lanarkshire and Fife, which I find quite remarkable. Now, I think when, you, when we looked at the, the explanations and the data, what is very apparent is that in Fife and South Lanarkshire, something quite different is happening in terms of planning, and that there is, an issue, that, that there is a, more of a, an inclination to grant permission for small family sites. Now, this would be, if you have a small patch of land, you would be having maybe four or five pitches for friends and family to come into. Now, obviously, you have to have the money to be able to afford the land. Um, it will not resolve, that in itself does not resolve all of the pressure in the system, but it certainly has a bearing on it. So the first proposal which we put forward in terms of the Planning Act um, or the Planning Bill going through is that there should be a presumption towards granting permission for small family sites where other, all other circumstances are appropriate. So the land is habitable, it's not on an industrial area or things, but a presumption towards small planning permission for small family sites we think could take some of the pressure, some of the demand out of the system. The other area which I would draw the committee's attention to is new build. We have a significant amount of new build going on in Scotland. Um, and if you look at a, a town, Chapel Hall, which is a new town being built outside Stonehaven, there is in the deeds of the town, um, once they reach a certain size of completion of housing, and I think it's seven, 1,700 houses, just over 1,700 houses, the developer is required to build a gypsy traveller site. Now, the developer at this point is offering Aberdeenshire Council £100,000 to get out of that element of the contract. And I'm not going to comment on that, but I think it's a really interesting idea that as if we are developing new areas of housing, there's a real potential here to locate gypsy traveller sites before the, t the ground is broken that you can then have as many of the issues which have come up in committee about poor access to schools, poor access to healthcare, you can address in a modern site ad adjacent to a new development. So again, in terms of a recommendation for the planning bill, we have put forward that there should be a presumption towards planning consent for gypsy traveller sites on new build areas. Now, we're not planning experts. Um, I have spoken to some planners who have said there are potentially some funding problems about this. If it's a private development, how will the private developers recoup that funding? I think this is an issue which government and this committee could look at very profitably, very favourably. But to me, um, it's an issue of extending bridging loans and credit to developers to enable them to do that. So two, I think, real, for the first time in a long time, two potential ways of starting to address the issue about land. Um, through a presumption of small family sites and new build attached to new developments. And to me, the fundamental issue of prejudice comes back to the pressure on land, that gypsy travellers are very often being forced into um, staying in areas or pitching in areas where it, they don't want to be, where other people don't want them to be, but this is because of a lack of provision across Scotland, which has been evident for many, many years. So I'm happy, more than happy to explore any of these things further with the committee and I really welcome the opportunity to, to put something perhaps a bit more positive forward. Yep, th thanks very much, Chris, and uh, um, I'm glad you had the time to, to uh, elaborate on that. If, if we speak, hear, hear from Michelle and Maureen and then come in with questions, if, if members are concert, con uh, content with that. Michelle. Thank you. Um, thanks for the invitation to come back again. Um, and it's really hard to believe that it's five years since the care inquiry and the accommodation inquiry, but it's even harder to believe that it's 16 years since the 2001 inquiry, which sparked off a lot of this interest. Um, for my sins, I was involved in that initial inquiry as well. Um, but I also think I need to say that I'm an optimist. 
Um, and I'll come back to that later on, because much of what I'm about to say may sound rather pessimistic, but unfortunately that's the world we live in. And also the evidence that um, I will give this morning is based on MECOP's experience of working on a daily basis with gypsies and travellers who are living in rural and urban areas of Scotland. Um, there's, in preparation for today, I had a look over some of the old reports and the reviews and the recommendations. And I think there's five or six common themes that come out which I'd like to concentrate on. Um, one of the first ones um, some people won't be surprised to hear is the need for strong leadership at a national level. There is ample evidence that if some issues are left to local authorities or local providers, there'll be no change. Um, that you could look at accommodation as one example of that. There is mention of gypsy travellers in many local housing strategies, for example, but there isn't any there aren't any sites, new sites being built. And I think um, some of the suggestions that Chris has made are certainly worthy of further exploration. Second area is the significant inequalities that exist across accommodation, education and health. Um, but to my knowledge, um, in relation to health, for example, and the high rates of long-term conditions, there are still no targeted or focused campaigns on some of those issues. There's also, thirdly, a pressing need to improve engagement with gypsy travellers. Too often, we're still hearing they're hard to engage with, they're difficult to engage, they don't want to engage. Sorry, surely we're we beyond that. The onus is on the service providers to find ways to engage, to creative ways, innovative ways. Sometimes it's not even about being creative, sometimes it's just about speaking to people and being respectful and really listening and acting on what's been heard. There are examples of what works up and down the country. Very often these have been led by small voluntary organisations, but nevertheless there are examples that can be built upon or be perhaps used as templates to improve practice. And because of the reluctance to engage with gypsy travellers, I think there's an ever-widening gap between what service providers and civic leaders think the issues are and think the situation is and what the reality is for many gypsy travellers, what their experiences are. And those, that, widen, that gap was highlighted in the 2012 and 13 reports, but I think it continues to widen. As I said earlier, there are examples of good practice, but very often these are localised and they're short-lived, quite often on a shoestring budget, but nevertheless they could, they're in schools, they're in museums, they're in the field of mental health, but they could be built upon and they could be um, continued. What's missing is a robust and a national strategy which is fully resourced, adequately monitored, has appropriate timescales both in the short term, medium and long term, and it needs to be outcome focused with smart objectives. These are things that most of us in the rest of our lives see on a regular basis. You see strategies which are smart, but unfortunately in relation to gypsy travellers at national level, we haven't seen that strategy. And finally, um, as Chris said, I believe the biggest issue and what we hear from our casework on a regular basis is around discrimination and prejudice. There are appalling levels of impartiality and professionalism amongst some service providers. And you don't have to look far in the media or else in policy documents to see examples of stereotyping and negative reporting, which thankfully would be completely unacceptable in relation to other communities within um, Scottish society. And whoever, um, I think the stereotyping and the prejudice affects every single gypsy traveller in Scotland. Whether you have been directly discriminated against or not, you are all being tarred with the same brush. The government's own research has highlighted how entrenched attitudes haven't really shifted very much over the last few years. And these attitudes affect all gypsy travellers, whether they are living in a house or living in a site, whether they are young or old. 
They affect teenagers who are trying to access restaurants or clubs. They affect children and students in university who are not seeing their history and their culture recognised or the contributions of their ancestors acknowledged in society. They affect men and women who are trying to gain an unemployment, who are being told they need to change their name or their address in, a, in order to access a service. They affect carers who are trying to get adaptations in their home and they're not being able to do so because they happen to live on a gypsy traveller site. Long term, this affects the way community members view the world. It affects the way the services they access, the way they bring up their children, who they do and don't engage with. And it affects their sense of belonging within Scottish society. And in many cases, this, that's severely lacking. Since 2001, there have been various calls for, and they've had various um, titles, but sometimes it's been called a public relations campaign. Sometimes it's been called awareness raising. Um, more recently, it's been called zero tolerance towards these attitudes and this kind of stereotyping. But to date, these campaigns have failed to materialise. There are opportunities now, I believe, around hate crime to prioritise these issues, but they need to be in there at the beginning and they need to be at a significant level. I said at the beginning that I was an optimist and that might surprise you, but I, I truly believe in that because MECOP works with a lot of strong and proud individuals who are active and engaged, not only within their own community, but in, within society more generally. And those people have a wealth of experience and um, ideas that they would welcome to share. And are, they are sharing them, but albeit at a local level on quite a small scale. And finally, I just wanted to end with a quote which really touched me. We've been running some um, bespoke short breaks for gypsy travellers and the people they care for over the last couple of years. And contrary to the idea that gypsy travellers are hard to engage with, there's been a waiting list for every event over the last two and a half years. A carer for a teenager who has learning disabilities living in a rural area that we work in attended a, one of these breaks recently and it's fair to say that she was very reluctant to attend having had quite negative experiences of respite in the past. However, she came along and her quote to a staff member in the car going home was, I really felt like I belonged and then she paused and said, and that doesn't happen very often. Thank you. Yeah, it says, says a lot, doesn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. Thank, thanks very much, Michelle. Um, Maureen. Thank you, and thanks very much for having me here. I think this is the first time I've been at this committee, although my predecessor from STEP, I think, was here, so thanks for having me. Um, I understood just to give you a sort of general overview of what our work is and where we feel that additional work is needed um, within education specifically, but thinking about education in the broadest sense. So um, at STEP, we've kind of, we've revised the way that we work over the last three or four years. We're based at the University of Edinburgh, and we started off by gathering uh, information, both from um, the literature, because we're quite research focused, from gypsy traveler communities and from school staff. And in doing that, we, a lot of our work has chimed with what um, has already been said here today. We've had to actually devise new methods for actually consulting and collaborating with the Gypsy Traveller community. And we feel as though we've actually made some success in doing that. But in doing that, um, some of the findings, the information that has evolved from these processes has been really alarming and actually has proved to be... Um, a bit more concerning than even the, the current information that we've got um, would lead us to believe. Um, we try to work in partnership with communities uh, in everything we do, and then we take our findings and we disseminate them on a national level. And you'll all be aware of the fact that within education, gypsy travellers in the last, well, obviously, um, 
from the 2011 census to the 2013 census, 15 census, there has been very, very little improvement in educational attainment, in attendance. There has been an increase in exclusions, um, and we can think about that in terms of the bullying conversation I think that we have today. So again, the patterns that are being described before, there's very, very little change. There's also an issue for me in terms of actually gathering evidence in the first place because statistics for me um, in relation to gypsy travellers mean very, very little. Um, we know that many, many young people and their families choose not to identify as a gypsy traveller, even though they're entitled to do so. Um, so we have the problem of young gypsy travellers being in school and not getting the additional support they need, and the social, emotional and educational problems that arise are not attended to in the way that they need to be. And also we have the problem of, of, of not having um, a true count of the number of gypsy travellers who are not in receipt of any form of education in Scotland. And we believe that these numbers go into their thousands, not hundreds. So um, this, this kind of leads me on to the whole notion of Scottish education. And one of the issues I have at the moment is the fact that we do have really um, effective policies in place. And, and a lot of these have been attended to over the last um, three or four five years with the additional support for learning the Children's Scotland Act, with the, the work that's been done on GERFIC, and of course um, starting to think about UNCRC and how we actually bring that into um, ongoing policy in schools. So if I take, for example, um, the Additional Support for Learning Act, I, I just think it's a really good um, way to measure uh, the, the problem. In the policy, there's a whole list of criteria that makes a child eligible for additional support. Um, such as being bullied, um, interrupted learning, um, uh, not attending school regularly, um, being looked after, things like that. But for me, the ones that would ensure an effective additional support package for gypsy travellers are soft descriptors. And very, very often it's not explicit enough and gypsy travellers fall through the net and are not in receipt of the support that they actually need. Um, the counter-argument that may come from the normative view of education would be, but we've got effective services, we've got effective policies, why are they not able to be delivered? And the argument, and I think I have a business case for this, is the fact that there is an additional piece of work that needs to be done for society to reach out to gypsy traveller families in particular, not just the children, but the families, and give them the assurances that Scottish education is now a flexible thing, that it can actually give them the learning pathways that will secure their economic futures, because that's really what families are interested in. When we did a survey of families, uh, we asked what were the main barriers um, to education, and I can just give you a couple of them here. Um, the main reason that gypsy traveller parents give for not allowing their children to go to secondary school specifically, although many go to primary, is bullying and discrimination. And our view um, in STEP and, and many other agencies is the fact that this is actually a narrative that they've inherited within their culture. And actually, we think it can be challenged because many schools are very adept at, at dealing with bullying and discrimination now. And we've been working in a lot of training packages with local authorities and schools and at national level. And we can see a real shift, but the parents have changed their attitudes. What this then leads on to is a huge responsibility being placed on the child. So the stories that we see are children going to primary school and actually um, doing very well, excelling in fact, in terms of educational attainment when they're regularly attending. And their peers are going on to secondary school and they're left with the burden of trying to make sense of the culture of the home and the culture of the education world in Scotland. And, and this has actually been shown to lead to um, quite significant social, emotional and behavioural difficulties within the children. So imagine a child sitting in a classroom while everybody else goes to do the transition visits to secondary school and they're not allowed to go because their parents will not let them. So we've been doing some work with families on this and um, there, we've got lots of solutions uh, or potential solutions whereby there are halfway houses. We can have extensions of primary school in other buildings, you know, even in primary um, 
primary schools, we've got three or four head teachers in Scotland at the moment who are willing to offer rooms in their school as extensions to the primary learning, as a bridge into a future in education. I, I can also report that there's an increasing number of children who are leaving primary school because of um, cultural, um, I suppose, pressure at the age of 11, going to live the life of the family, whether it's... Um, there, there's a, a real gender divide here as well. So we've got a lot of girls who work in the caravan with the parents and carry out domestic um, duties. And we've got boys who go off and work with their fathers and uh, continue the family businesses. But many, many children and young people are now turning up at alternative education, places like community centres, libraries, and asking for um, additional support or some kind of education at the age of 14, 15. So I, I just feel in Scotland nowadays we should be able to kind of bridge um, this divide, this big gulf. Um, it, it, the word, I think, which is key to all of this is transition. It's actually getting children into school in the first place and supporting families to do that. And we've got models of practice that show how to do that successfully. Getting children between the primary school and the secondary school and then getting children to a positive destination because most families will tell you nowadays that um, their, their, their traditional um, work patterns can't support their future generations. So that's, that's a major problem. Have I got time for one more yeah, yeah. issue? Is that all right? Um, just to touch on, I, I think, probably the most... Um, the most worrying thing. We obviously have structural issues which I think we need to um, address in terms of making the secondary school a more flexible place. At the moment, gypsy travellers run from secondary school because they know if they enrol, they can get tracked. So they think it's easier not to do it. In some places, I've been able to negotiate with teachers, head teachers, with schools, local authorities, and say, can we be flexible? Can we say to them, join, and then we'll allow you to leave if you do want to but dip your toe in the water? Um, but the main thing, I think, which is a real barrier um, and uh, it's really concerning, is, is the attitudinal um, barriers, which are still coming from staff uh, and also, I think, institutions. And I think there's a really fine line between the people and the institution. So I can give you one quote uh, from last week where we were doing some outreach work um, within a local authority. And the school that we were working with had to um, ask for permission from within the authority, from the senior management team. And one of the comments was, well, don't make it too good because they'll all come running. So we're still dealing with that. It's absolutely shocking. Um, but we again, we've got policy and we've got guidance and we've got practice that could be addressing that. For example, the GTC's... Um, lifelong learning and development for, for, for teaching staff has got um, a huge um, section um, on integrity and social justice where professionals are required to examine their own personal and professional values, beliefs and assumptions. And I just think we need to do so much more work in that area. And I, I think that's probably the key to an awful lot of the challenges that we face within the bullying, discrimination and attendance um, challenges that we've got in primary schools at the moment, and in secondary schools at the moment. <coughs> Thank you. Thank, thanks very much, Maureen. Um, a, a lot in that and, and, and different aspects from, from all of our witnesses this morning. We're going to go straight into questions, if, if, if you don't mind. I've got Mary up first and then Alex. Um, Mary's uh, been a, a, a champion for this uh, cause for a long time, and I suppose both of us should declare an interest in being honorary members of the Showman's guilt um, for, for, for um, past endeavours, I think. So we, we should actually probably properly declare that, to be honest, um, uh, in this inquiry. But Mary, if you want to continue with your questions. Thank you very much, um, convener, and good morning. It's, in, in some ways, it's good to see you, but I have to say I am deeply, deeply disappointed that we are once again talking about gypsy travellers and the issues that gypsy travellers have and certainly the anecdotal evidence that, um, that I have is that nothing or very little has changed since the last report was done in um, 2013. And what I wanted to do was read out bits, <coughs> excuse me, bits of some of the recommendations to get your thoughts on whether anything at all has actually um, progressed or anything has been done. 
So recommendation 46 was that responsibility for support of gypsy travellers um, lies across many government portfolios and local authorities, um, and it's crucial that the existing Scottish government Scottish Government Minister is given a specific and overarching responsibility for support and profile raising of gypsy travellers. 47 says there is a very real possibility of increased apathy amongst the gypsy traveller population. We strongly recommend that the Scottish Government launch a national public awareness raising campaign aimed at tackling discrimination and racism. And I suppose if you think about the show racism, the red card, and how successful that was, mm -hmm. and how everyone bought into that, I honestly cannot understand why that's not been done for, for gypsy travellers. Um, for recommendation 49, there has been a failure of leadership at local, community and national level. Um, Recommendation 80, it's essential that gypsy travellers as site tenants have the same rights and responsibilities as people living in fixed housing. I kind of suspect what your answers are going to be in all of this, but I'm going to read it all out anyway. Um, and the final conclusion, 100, uh, paragraph 136, and it says, 12 years on from the first Scottish Parliament inquiry into gypsy traveller life, it is galling to see the appalling situation of many gypsy travellers is little changed. We are staggered to find ourselves hearing the same issues and making the same recommendations that we heard in 2001. There must be strong leadership at all levels, but the need for a powerful ministerial voice is abundantly clear. The time has come for the Scottish Government and COSLA to take matters in hand with a national strategy to support local authorities and local councillors in developing fit-for-purpose housing strategies. And finally, we say it's crucial the work is carried out at both local level to encourage the settled community to accept the gypsy traveller way of life and at a national level through a government-led public awareness campaign. And I want to finish in much the same way that, that Michelle did by... Um, lifting a quote from the report that we did in, in 2013. <clears throat> and it's a quote from Donald Stewart, who was one of the, the Gypsy Traveller witnesses that, that came to speak to the committee. And he said, it has been all talk and we have not seen any action. It's about time that something got done because neither we nor other travellers are benefiting. No sites are being built. We are not seeing any difference. It's just as hard as it used to be. Has anything changed? Very little. <laughs> I think one positive move um, <coughs> is the inclusion of gypsy traveller sites in the Scottish um, Housing Charter and the fact that the housing regulator um, now has that role um, to inspect sites. Um, and the minimum sites gui guidance that is in place. But I would caveat, caveat on that by saying it's guidance and it's perhaps not strong enough because there are countless examples of where guidance has been put in place and has been blatantly ignored at a local level. Um, but the the housing regulator did a thematic inquiry into gypsy travel right, sites and yeah. made a number of recommendations as well. Yep. But I don't think any of those recommendations have been have been pu pushed through to the end, have Not they? Not that I'm aware of. We did no. some training that was led by gypsy travellers earlier in the year with the regulator. And one of the reasons for that was to try and um, highlight to them, um, sometimes it's not just about asking questions or getting evidence from social landlords, sometimes it's about understanding the context and the power relationship to use but one example um, that's quoted in their thematic report in the period I think it was 2013 to 14 um, seven of the social landlords of the seven of the 15 who gave returns on service user satisfaction said that there was a hundred percent service user satisfaction on gypsy traveller sites, seven out of the 15. That was actually during the same period that Mary and other committee members were out on sites and saw for themselves, and I, I don't have the quote to hand, but I think it was words to the effect of appalling and horrendous conditions on site. So somebody somewhere 
is missing the point, to put it very, very blatantly. But nevertheless, the fact that the regulator has a role in relation to sites, I think, is, um, is positive, but it probably needs to be much further, go much further. Mm. Chris? Um, positively, um, we do have the, um, the regulation of sites, which will come in in 2018. Um, that is a very long lead-in period, and it means that many gypsy travellers have continued to live in inappropriate and poor housing conditions, which has been commented on repeatedly by the committee and also by um, international um, commentators. Um, there is largely, I think you can say, the tenancy rights on sites have become stronger and perhaps um, the, there's, there's an encouragement to adopting um, more of a, a bespoke, or not a bespoke, more of a, a national template approach to it, which I think is encouraging. Um, oddly, and I don't know if Michelle um, and Maureen will agree with me, we, um, in terms of press coverage, which has been one of the things which has bedeviled um, gypsy travel relations in the community, we have seen some success in in the small and particularly Scottish press. Um, it's rare, quite rare now to see bulletin boards in the Scottish local papers, um, which used to be filled with really virulent comments. And I've spoken to a number of editors who've just said it's not worth the hassle any longer. As the committee will probably know, we publish guidance to editors, and it's unique that we have never felt the need to publish guidance about any other group of people in Great Britain for newspaper editors other than Gypsy Travellers. I can't say that that is mirrored by the national tabloids, um, who still, you regularly, if you go onto their sites, you will see extraordinarily hateful comments there. So we have had some progress. I would, however, pick up on two things, um, if you'll allow me, just very briefly. Um, whilst I agree that um, we need to have consciousness raising and public campaigning, I think it needs to be quite targeted at the particular groups of people, and this may be um, homeowners, elected members, who are who have the most negative attitudes. And I think we also need to think about how we do this, because a lot of these kind of public attitudes things are based on contact theory, which is essentially the more that you know about this group. It's a misunderstanding, and if you know more about this group, you'll actually like them. I think that actually this is a conflict situation where we have two groups of people with opposing rights, and we need to do something more about trying to mediate in that situation. The other issue which I would pick up about the failure of leadership, I would completely agree on that. But I think it's also about the relationship between central and local government, and that successive governments in Scotland have pulled away from a national strategy, which would imply or infer that they tell local authorities what to do. And in this case, it's about site provision. Um, and I think that there could be far greater emphasis from national government in their relations with local government, that this is a Scottish-wide problem. It's not something which is unique to one local authority, and we need a Scottish response to this, not an individual local authority response, because what we see is many local authorities simply shifting the buck, buck to others. And what alarms me from the Scottish government's own research is the almost complete absence of sites in the west of in west central scotland um, we know there is demand but there is no provision and i find that quite extraordinary because i mean certainly the message that, that came over loud and clear from local authorities when we were doing this inquiry was that they wanted the government to have a national strategy they wanted the government to tell them you must build sites and the, there was more than one reason for that because obviously if the government compelled them to build sites they then have someone almost to blame. Um, and, and that's what they wanted. They wanted to be able to blame the government and say, look, we've been told to do this. Um, because they, they do get a lot of negative press for lots of reasons that I don't care to go into. Um, but local authorities shy away from, from, from standing up for the gypsy traveller community and don't want to build sites because of the, um, the comments that they get from um, people that live in their area. So they want a national, a national strategy. Has any progress at all been made in the housing needs assessments for um, gypsy travellers? Because that was a particular issue as well. I, I, very briefly, I mean, I, I haven't looked at all of them. Um, there's a common issue in the housing needs assessment, and it's not 
unique to gypsy travellers. I've also looked at it from a disability point of view. And whilst there may be a description of the issue and the needs, what we do not see is a response to those needs in the investment programmes. So it will describe, um, and I particularly, the one which I'm particularly conscious of is the Glasgow and Clyde Valley one, um, and this is local authorities who have no sites predominantly saying that there is no need. And I find that quite extraordinary, that there is no need in Ayrshire for gypsy traveller sites. That just doesn't seem to make sense to me. Okay. Can I just um, ask a follow-up question around um, an awareness raising campaign, some kind of strategy? Because I mentioned the show racism, racism the red card, but I don't think any kind of strategy to, to raise awareness and try and break down the barriers um, th that gypsy travellers face every day. It wouldn't work unless gypsy travellers were involved in that campaign. Um, so do you think that gypsy travellers are ready to become involved in that, given everything that's happened to them since 2001 with inquiry after inquiry after inquiry and promise after promise after promise? Would they still want to be involved in something like that? I certainly can't speak for gypsy travellers um, generally, but um, what I can say is that a lot of the people we work with are ready to, and are already actually doing things to raise awareness in their own local communities, whether that's by getting involved in, in, our, ex in our case, exam um, exhibitions such as Moving Minds, or whether it's leading training workshops. Um, they're, they're out there speaking to people, trying to raise awareness and becoming more confident in doing so. Um, but it's certainly true that there are um, levels of apathy and that, you know, given what we've just heard, that's completely understandable. Um, but I would completely agree that gypsy travellers have to be at the core um, of any kind of campaign. And I think it's also worth bearing in mind some of the uh, recommendations from the Christie Commission and just being cognisant of the, the inter, what he, I think Christy called the intergenerational cycles and the dangers of communities and individuals who are marginalised being left behind. Um, and I think in, in relation to gypsy travellers, there's a real risk of that happening yet again. There's a very Chris, quick comment think, on... Yeah, the, you want, just a very comment quick on comment on that. Then on I've got a quick question, I think, maybe yeah. directed to you, Chris. Whilst okay. I would completely agree with Michelle that it is immensely desirable for gypsy travellers to be at the heart of a campaign. The problem is not of gypsy travellers making. And I think it's really important that we, the locus for change is about Scottish society, it's about settled communities, it's about politicians, it's about service providers. It's not the responsibility of gypsy travellers to do that. So. The, the results of the latest social attitudes survey in relation to gypsy travellers, it's horrifying. It's horrifying. And if I cast my mind back to the inquiry that we did last session and all the myth-busting stuff that the Gypsy Travellers did, is, is that work still ongoing? And Michelle, do you see benefit in, in something like that being rolled out across every single school, every local authority, every elected member do something like that? Yes, is the okay. short answer to that. Um, it is still going on, but I'm, as I kind of hinted at earlier, unfortunately, it's in very local areas. Um, but there are examples of campaigns um, from Ireland. There's a new campaign that was just launched in London a couple of weeks ago, a hashtag campaign, which is, you know, along the lines of, you know, this person is a mother, uh, a carer, uh, you know, um, a volunteer, and also they're a gypsy traveller. But why, why do people always just focus on that one label? I'll be That's where I want to go, actually, with more than a question, to, to, to be honest. And it is on the back of the, the NATSEN uh, briefing that we had with Professor Curtis. There was dramatic drops in lots of other characteristics, apart from mental health and gypsy travellers. Both, both of these were still up in the high, high 30s. And it, it strikes me, I was on the Education Committee between 2007 and 2011, we put the, through the additional support needs plans and there was a huge emphasis on um, maybe Maureen will comment on it's a huge emphasis on um, education and maintaining education especially for young people who had additional support needs as well so uh, there maybe needs to be a look at whether that's actually working or not but it struck me in in, in relation to a strategy 
So we've got the national census figures on prejudice, and we, we, we know what they say. We've got sites and planning consent, where we have strategy and, and, and policy in there. We have health and social care, where there is policy in there as well. And we have education and additional support needs, where there's policy in there as well. It wouldn't take a huge leap to create a strategy from all of that and link it together. Yeah, yeah. So I, I suppose my question to you is about that label and whether actually you need that label. One of the specific uh, um, powers that this place now has is to add additional <coughs> protected characteristic groups to the Equality Act. And whether it is maybe now time to, to use uh, Sean's phrase that he gave me, to, to use a sledgehammer to crack a nut with this, that we actually need to put in you know, a specific uh, recommendation where um, in the Equality Act that becomes a specific protected group. Um, which would focus minds as well, because when it becomes a law, you know, it compels people to do things um, within the law. Is that something you think that would be, a, you know, a way forward? I mean, we, we've obviously looked at lots of aspects of this this morning and, and, and hopefully looking for some way forward. But would that be a way forward that would maybe create um, that better outlook for, for, for the families and the young people that, that we're talking about? Maureen, I was wondering whether you had anything to add or a comment on, on that? For me, absolutely, because we've just uh, finished the consultation for the guidance. It's got ministerial approval, obviously, for improving educational outcomes for um, young people um, from mobile cultures. And it links to all the policy that you've just described. But as I said earlier, um, when I was describing some of our issues, is it's not explicit enough in the policy. And what you're describing there would absolutely make that stand out. And it, it, it feeds into the whole leadership um, discussion as well, um, because the people that we work with do fantastic work. And you know, on a project by project basis, and on a local authority by local authority basis, you know, there are great examples of practice and things are changing. But each of these people, I mean, we, we run a network of representatives from each of the local authorities in Scotland. And I would say the majority of them feel unsupported within their authority in terms of the leadership and the resources that they actually need to do the kind of work that they're doing. So the things that do make leaders stand up and take notice are, 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 are what you're describing, I think. I think it has to be much, much more explicit. And I think a protected characteristic would be fantastic. OK. Alex. Thank you, Kabina. Uh, oh, Chris, do you want to come back? Come back I, I, I really yeah, do yeah, on course. that point. Um, gypsy travellers are already covered by the Equality Act. It is quite clear that they are covered by the Equality Act. Um, prior to the case which defined that in Scotland, um, the presumption from the Scottish Government, from the police, from the Equality and Human Rights Commission and everybody else was that they were covered. Um, they just hadn't gone to court. I think it's a red herring, myself. I don't think that... I mean, the protection is there. What is being done with that protection is the issue. So a national strategy which focused um, on trying to address some of the deep-seated inequalities that gypsy travellers face would be welcome. I think that uh, creating a specific protected characteristic for a group who are already covered by the law is unnecessary and I think is actually a distraction. Fair comment. <laughs> Fair comment. Alex. Thank you, Convener. Good, good morning to the panel and thank you for coming to see us this morning. I found your contributions absolutely fascinating. I have to admit this is an area I, I don't know very much about, but you've certainly um, ad addressed some of that, my, the gaps in my knowledge today. Um, I, my interest in, in a lot of what you've said has been particularly around children in uh, gypsy travellers communities and, and I'd refer everyone to my member of uh, my registered members interest in that I used to be the convener of the Scottish Alliance for Children's Rights um, and work for an organization that did do some work with uh, gypsy traveler communities um, Maureen you did a really good job of sort of telling us about the uh, um, additional support for learning needs of young people in these communities what I'm keen to know about is um, those who are under supervision because on any given day in Scotland we have 15,000 children who are um, looked after. Um, the majority of those are looked after at home and it strikes me there are very particular individual needs in gypsy traveller communities for those young people who are under supervision and looked after at home because if those homes are moving then uh, it must it would be particularly difficult to 
offer that kind of social work supervision. And I just wonder if you could explore some of the particular challenges around offering support to young people who are looked after at home in, in those situations. Um, to be honest, the very few gypsy travellers that I know of, and, and um, Michelle might correct me here, are looked after at home in mobile, in mobile situations. So where, where a child is removed from a family, it will, will tend not to be a mobile family that the child will go to. Um, where there are um, welfare concerns with gypsy traveller children who are still within their family, um, the same interagency kind of working set up um, will, will, will kick into action. Um, so I, I'm not quite sure. When I say looked after at home, I mean they're not taken away from their family unit. They're just given extra support, as in, um, you know, in the same way that, you know, right. children in mainstream families who are taken under supervision aren't taken away from their families. They're just given the extra support of social work intervention. Yes. And they're under, um, under supervision order from the children's panel. Um, I imagine the same must be true for some families, um, even in itinerant lifestyles who yeah. are nomadic um, that that needs must and if it's not it makes me troubled that we're not getting to these young people because if as Chris said the life outcomes for these communities are demonstrably worse across the board um, then that suggests to me there should be a higher proportion of young people who might need to be taken into supervision and we might not be getting to them. I, I think there's definitely an issue with children who we would call are, who are under the radar who don't actually, who don't go to school. I think the minute they're in school, then the systems do kick into place and we have the same sort of GERFET guidance and they each have a named person. We'll have a coordinated support plan if they need that. For the children who don't go to school, it is, it's quite a muddy area in terms of who then within the local authority takes responsibility for the welfare of that child. Um, and particularly if the children um, are not registered at all or enrolled, um, and very often we find that their health number disappears off the radar as well, so that's never, ever passed on to the education authority. And, and that's a real live issue. It's a problem, definitely. The thing I've known about looked after children, having worked in the sector for 15 years, is that local authorities will do everything they can to avoid being the ones that have to carry the financial can for the support that's offered or, or that they are responsible for that supervision order. So if these families are moving around, then it makes it almost easier for local authorities to not have to take that up. Um, and finally, I, I could see Chris trying to come in here, and I, I'm glad, glad of that. And it's the fact that there, there's nothing in between being enrolled and not. Yeah. So local authorities, I think, are very, very happy, but not happy, but tend to not deal with children who are not enrolled within the, within the authority. Yeah. Well, that troubles me greatly, but... Um... Chris and Michelle both want to come in. Chris? I'm slightly uncomfortable with the, the premise perhaps behind the question, and I, mean, I think what Maureen has said um, is very clear that the predominant reason why gypsy traveller children are not attending school is because of bullying or because of parental fear of bullying. Um, to then have a social work intervention on the basis of, of being a victim of somebody else's actions to me doesn't seem appropriate. So, what I was oh, suggesting at all. I, I mean, every community, I mean, supervision orders are classless. You need mm. to take children into care at, at some stage in every community in Scotland. Okay, the demographics are such that um, the p percentage of children in more in deprived communities who are under supervision order is higher, much higher in some cases. Um, but that's because, not because of the lack of attendance at school, that's because of uh, chaotic family lifestyle factors or... Um, parental desertion or a huge range of issues why children need to be taken under supervision. I wasn't suggesting for a minute that it was because they weren't turning up at school. Okay. Um, Could I just say one thing? Of course. Just, uh, we, we did a bit of research um, with families um, at Gypsy Travellers. We did it for the Roma community, for the Show family community and um, for Gypsy Travellers. And we looked at the wellbeing indicators across the board for each of these communities. And I kind of maybe backs up some of what Chris is saying. It's very, uh, it was very clear that you couldn't jump to assumptions about the normative view of what being nurtured or safe might be, for example, for a gypsy traveller community. So, for example, they may be running around or they may be looked after by a 14-year-old or whatever, but they tended to 
not have any concerning levels of well-being, if you know what I mean. I, I accept all of that. Yeah. And there are, you know, cultural norms in those communities which are very different to the ones that we would, would recognise. However, um, I, I'm still troubled by the fact that you, you yourself referenced that group of young people who are, quote unquote, under the radar. Um, and whilst I, you know, I'm, I, I'm a big supporter of Gypsy traveller communities, I think I find the culture is fascinating. I think it's a part of our rich tapestry of Scotland. Um, but th that said, there will always be difficult situations where children are at risk. And if they are under the radar and they're not known to social services, they are more at risk than equivalent children who um, we, we find more easily or aren't, as you say, under the radar. So it's, I'm not worried about an, anything about you know, cultural aspects of gypsy traveller life, which would be strange to us in the way that we perceive the world. I am worried about those who still in those families that are chaotic, where neglect happens, where abuse happens, that we aren't necessarily as good at applying child protection legislation or um, with the Children's Act to give these children the care and support that they need through the state. Michelle. Hi, could I just pick up on an issue that's, I think it's related um, to what you've just said. The, the issue of mobility is another red herring, I think. Um, the vast majority of gypsy traveller families that we work with, and in fact I've worked with over the last 25 years, are not actually moving. They're not able to move. They're living in bricks and mortar, but they're still facing the kind of prejudice and discrimination that we've spoken about earlier. Uh, one small example, we did some research on self-directed support um, amongst gypsy travellers and whether there was an appetite for it and where the barriers might exist a couple of years ago. The main barrier identified by social work was mobility, the fact that people were on the move. The main barrier identified by families was prejudice. Um, the, there's, the, I, can, I think because of the word traveller, it's become a bit of a, a, a myth that people are constantly on the move. That is not possible anymore. Um, it may be something that people aspire to be on the move, for sure, but, um, but I think there's sometimes a tendency to over overly concentrate on the, the mobility aspect. Um, and there are many other aspects of the culture and heritage which are overshadowed by that. Chris? Um, I'm not aware of any research um, that's been published or unpublished which looks at levels of neglect or abuse um, between gypsy traveller communities and other communities. So whilst I appreciate there is an anxiety that children may be off the radar, that does not mean at all that they are being neglected or abused. And I think we need to turn the issue around and say, why are families and children disengaging from the rest of society? What, what is the issue? To me, I think we come back to this issue again of what's the responsibility of the education authority and individual schools here? Um, there was a, a survey done, um, I sorry, forget the MSP's name for a second, um, where they did an FOI of racial incidents recorded in schools in Scotland in the last three or four years. And there was a massive variation. Some areas, I think actually one was South Lanarkshire, where they recorded two or three. In Edinburgh, they recorded 150, 200. Now, one of the things that we are particularly concerned about is that whilst there may be very good practice in individual schools, um, that is not um, a uniform experience across Scotland. We have written to... Um, the minister really in urging them to put in place a requirement on local authorities and education authorities to record and publish um, racial and other forms of bullying in schools and also in capturing that information to actively work with other services particularly the police and particularly in housing i suspect as well because it's unlikely that prejudice which is being experienced or expressed in schools is only expressed in those schools. It is going to be part of a community. So I think we need to look at why gypsy travellers are not engaging. And I think it's because there are legitimate fears which have been um, um, already uh, addressed by Maureen about the likelihood or certainty of bullying and harassment. I want to try and get on with some of the other members. David, you wanted in with a quick question. Um, thank you, Convener. I think Mary's covered most of it, as I've probably expected her to do. Um, there's 32 local authorities in Scotland, and you highlighted in your evidence earlier that two local authorities were very good. I think two-thirds of the travel sites were 
and these two will go for it is self Lanarkshire and Fife. Is it a case in the perception of officials in the other local authorities that it's not on my doorstep, basically, their attitude? Because I cannot see how two local authorities could provide so many sites mm -hmm. across Scotland and there's 30 local authorities there, basically um, just ignoring the needs of the gypsy travellers. Um, the majority, vast majority of sites in these two local authorities um, in South Lanarkshire and Fife are from private hands. Right. So it's an issue about planning and planning consent. I, perhaps 20, 20 years ago, I would have blamed officials. Um, and I think there was a level of prejudice, and I'm sure there probably still is a level of prejudice. I think more and more when I speak to officials is a level of exasperation. Um, that they identify areas where sites could be built, they take them to committee, the committee knocks the, the, the thing back. Uh, to me, it's an issue about politicians and um, a discipline inside parties rather than a problem of an administration or, or the administration of these things. Could I come, come in on that point? Um, is that not to do with the local authority going out to community and consulting with them and saying this is what we will provide in the area? Catching that. I'm saying, is that not to do with a local authority going out into communities and saying, this is what we planned for the area, this is a consultation to do with local authorities and alleviating all these fears? We published research three years back, Phil Brown from Salford University, and what we did was say, what are the circumstances which make a good site? Um, and one of the things which came across very clearly, um, one was from a gypsy traveller run site in Scotland, where the engagement with local planning officers and, and councillors they said was absolutely instrumental. The other was, I think, in Carlisle, uh, Michelle, I'm sure you'll correct me if I'm wrong on this, where there was significant engagement with local communities around the site prior to the site being built to the point of taking them to other areas and saying, look, our house prices haven't collapsed. We haven't been subject of mass criminality. I know it's, it's, it's some of these very basic misunderstandings or misconceptions and prejudices that need to be addressed. Um, but I think I mean, politicians are responding to local pressure. But their job, part of the role of politicians in this, and I come to the, the, um, the general equality duty, which is a specific requirement on local authorities, is that they need to foster good community relations. What I do not see, in fact, bizarrely, Aberdeen, in turning down a site four or five years back, cited it would be dangerous to community relations if we allowed the site to be built. I, I find this a very strange, tortured logic. Thank you. OK, David. Yep. Yeah, thanks very much. Jeremy. Um, yeah, good morning. And again, thank you very much for coming. I mean, I think um, there are issues that Alex has picked up on, which I, I think we do need to develop further. But I know time is against us. So I, I want to come back to a couple of questions that I have in regard to what you were seeing, Chris, in regard to planning again. I suppose I should say I, I am just retired from being a councillor here in Edinburgh and sat for a few years on the um, planning committee in Edinburgh. Um, so my, my first question is really just really a kind of factual one, is what is your definition of a small family site? I don't have one. Uh, there is no definition. I think that's something which the government um, could be looking at. As a rule of thumb, um, what I, what I observe is sites of maybe four or five pitches um, on a piece of land owned by a gypsy traveller, possibly you know, less, far less than an acre. I don't have a... Okay. You know, I would suggest that if, this is, if, if the committee feel that this is a, an area worth exploring, it's something they may want to, to put some out to work into, we are happy to do that as well. But to actually start to define, obviously for the purposes of a, of a bill, what do we mean by a small site? But I think a presumption towards consent is, is really where we're trying to go with this. Uh, and the second issue is, again, it is more kind of a question one, and it's around the, the presumption for planning. I mean, clearly one of the issues, presumably, I, I ask this, not because I don't know the answer, I generally am asking the question, is land valuation, that in certain parts of Scotland, the value of land will be more than others. Is there any research done, you said that, where the community already own that land, the presumption should be there. Is there much land owned by the community already 
I, could you, I, I was unaware of that. My, my presumption was that we'd be looking to, to buy, literally buy the site financially first, and that was one of the issues as well. Or is it the other way around, that they, they own the land but can't get the planning permission? My sense, and again, I mean, I, I, I'm not expert in this, but particularly looking at um, press reporting and from areas of, what I perceive to be happening is that because of a frustration around a lack of local authority provision, individuals in the community are either have or are acquiring land um, where they are saying, well, actually, I'll, my family, my friends can stay here. Um, but it's... It, I think what we're looking for ultimately is a network, a patchwork of provision across Scotland, whether that is in local authority control, housing association control, private control. I'm not particularly bothered myself, but I think that we need to get over this hump of planning, planning consent, because that is what's holding back the development of sites. Okay. Um, and, and my very, very final quick question, I mean, again, a bit like Alex, this is not an area that I would claim to have, well, much expertise at all on. Um, and in fact, I did a quick survey of some of my, well, colleagues in the parliament to ask which minister is responsible for this. Uh, and the uh, answers were very low in regard to getting the answer correct. So I think even amongst us as politicians, there's a lack of ignorance in this area. But I, I suppose it was just a quick one back to you, Michelle, because I've always got the impression it's people who are moving around. Uh, do we know what percentage or what figure of the community are still moving around, still have that ability, and how many are more permanently based in one site? No, we don't have accurate numbers. Chris referred to the 2011 census, which included a, a category of gypsy travellers for the first time. And there was um, just over 4,000 people who ticked that box. But there are many thousands more gypsy travellers who, for whatever reason, feel that they have to deny their ethnicity um, for fear of the prejudice that they may encounter. Um, and those are very often people who are living in bricks and mortar. And it may be well that you know we're, we're living next door to some of those people, but sadly they, they still feel that they... Um, have to deny their ethnicity. So there are no accurate figures, either of those moving around or those settled. I, I, mean, I mean, again, I, I appreciate I, I come to this very new, so this is a question of ignorance. What, what I can't quite get my head around is, and, and if you can, maybe one of you can explain it, is I, I understand if you're travelling around, there are issues there. If I'm living in, as you say, bricks and mortar, maybe next to somebody and I go along to the school and register, how do they know I am part of that community? Because I'm living in a normal, whatever normal means, flat house. So is the issue with the school, or is it with, as I think one of you said, the historical view that they feel that we get bullied? And that isn't actually a reality in practice. And that's why I can't quite get my head right. Like if I'm living in a kind of community here in Edinburgh, I identify with that community, but how would the local school know I'm part of that if I don't declare it? Maureen might want to come in on that particular point about school, um, but there are many ways in which people could be identified as coming from a gypsy traveller community. It could be through their surname, it could be by the kind of work that they're engaged in, could be, um, I mean, we've had examples of people who lived in lived in a flat in Edinburgh, for example, and she felt that she had to tell her relatives not to come and visit her because they drove a particular kind of vehicle um, or they were engaged in a particular kind of work, and she felt that that would let her neighbours know that she was a gypsy traveller. In relation to school, do you want to... Come well, in relation to schools, I mean, we have stories of um, you know, some young people have gone to university and using false addresses in houses um, for their entrance information... Uh, because they felt they'd be discriminated against. But I have to say, the issue of mobility, um, I think, chimes differently with each of the, the concerns to do... I mean, my area is only education, and mobility is a huge issue still in Scotland with education. We have schools where we can have 20 young people turn up on a Wednesday morning unexpected, and schools have to very, very quickly um, be able to cope with that bring in additional staff and then they may find that the children have moved on 
and they're, they're left with extra staff and problems with budgeting. So th there is a real instability. So, so Maureen, do you have a feel for how many people are travelling? I, we can only give you anecdotal accounts. I mean, I, I can give you loads of... Each local authority will give you an anecdotal account. Every every traveller education officer or gypsy traveller liaison officer will keep account of the numbers of travellers who go through their authority all the time. But that's not a national... There's, there's no national mechanism for keeping that information. Okay. Chris. Um, again, um, I think there's an issue between those people who would like to travel but who are unable to because traditional travelling sites have been shut off, bouldered off, um, the lack of provision, and those people who, for educational purposes or health purposes or caring purposes, feel they have to move into uh, bricks and mortar housing. So I think, again, we're talking about an issue of culture, we're talking about an issue of economics. Gypsy travellers travelled to work very often as well. Um, now, increasingly, the opportunities to travel have been broken down because of the the, um, the traditional stopping places, the private sites closing. So, I think we. I, I understand your concern. It's an area which bedevils the whole issue of gypsy travellers. Is that we know, we have so little hard evidence. There's a, a well quoted figure of male life expectancy amongst gypsy travellers being what 55, something like that. But we have no epid, epid, we have no health studies. <laughs> That's the word um, so of why this may be. I mean, we know there's an issue, but we're not going into it in any depth. So I know that there's a there's not a huge amount of desire in the community for more research, but I think there is something about general statistics about incidences of heart disease or things like that that we could and should be picking up. <coughs> I think I just highlighted uh, health uh, and health inequalities is, is a, a, you know, something that we should maybe take a, a closer look at. And we, we've just conducted an inquiry on destitution and the impact that has on health and the ability to access health, to maintain, you know, ongoing treatment. And it strikes me that there would be similar, uh, um, you know, situations for for, for, for gypsy traveller communities uh, as we we looked at for for destitute uh, people. Uh, we had one case where the TB nurses managed to track someone who was uh, resistant to their medication, so they needed additional support for 12 months over 13 different addresses. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's quite a, a similar scenario on how, how do we make sure that people get the right health care, and that strikes me as maybe an area we need to shine a bit of a light on. One of my concerns is, I mean, the, the committee's last two reports, um, one on housing and then one on health and care. The housing one has had a lot of focus and there's been a lot of work in Scottish Government um, engaging on the issue. So we've seen things like tenancy rights, we've seen things about minimum standards. Um, I have not seen any similar response from the NHS or from social work in Scotland to the committee's recommendations and that worries me enormously because we're talking about an absolutely fundamental issue of if you're not healthy you're unable to participate economically socially civically um, and i am concerned that um, an institution with the resources of the nhs has no defined approach to investigating or addressing what are believed to be really worrying health inequalities in the community it's where maybe an analysis on a strategy pulling out all the threads that we talked about earlier would show where the gaps are. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, Mary. A very brief um, follow-up question on health. Is there is there still evidence that, that GPs are turning away gypsy travellers? Because that was one of the things we found when we did the, the inquiry in, in, into care, that gypsy travellers were, uh, were being refused access to, to, to GPs. Is that still happening? From our casework, there are examples of people being asked for additional evidence, additional proof of identity, um, in order to be registered with a GP. OK, that's fine. I think we're pretty exhausted with questions, yeah? <laughs>
Yeah, any other members got anything else to add? Is there anything else that you think we've not covered this morning that you're, you've got a burning issue you want to say? Chris is almost right <laughs> out the stock straight away. OK, <laughs> um, my apologies. I, I, no, please, oh, please, please don't apologise yeah. <laughs> at all because we're really keen to hear from you. I, I think it's interesting with the, the change in remit in the committee um, and the embracing of human rights issues. For a long time, I've felt that there is limited... Um, pressure or the limited gains that can be made through the Equality Act. Um, the issue is something far, far more fundamental than that. I think that adopting a human rights approach to gypsy travellers, when we look at things like adequate health care, adequate accommodation, the ability to participate economically or socially or civically, is actually far more compelling. Um, and I think it's really interesting that increasingly we're seeing international um, groups, whether that be the, the Council of the British Isles or the UN rapporteurs, actually starting to focus on the human rights issues which we need to engage and I would really encourage the committee to start to perhaps move away, not move away from the equality issues but to embrace the human rights arguments and concepts as much as the equality ones. No, I agree. The Council of Europe Current Affairs Committee which I currently sit on uh, delivered a, a report when just a few months ago um, and it was led by a, a Manchester um, uh, councillor um, but across the whole of Europe a, a strategy on a European-wide strategy, and it was health education. And so it's maybe worth our while getting a, a wee copy of that report for everyone to ha have a look at that as well. Because you're saying about the UN, you, you know, the, the Human Rights Act, the things that we are doing, but there's, 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 there's really good practice across the whole of Europe that maybe we could tap into uh, and, and raise a profile on this. And I appreciate um, your uh, continued support about the human rights element of, of this committee, because I think if we take a human rights approach to all of this, then that's when we get, we pick out where, where the good things are, but where there is gaps, and we, we, we should tackle those. Michelle, did you want to come back in? Um, just a couple of very small things. Um, in relation to health and social care, um, to borrow a, a term that's often used in the mental health field, I think there's very often, uh, uh, we encounter examples of what's known as diagnostic overshadowing whereby the, the issue that somebody's presenting with, whether that's physical health or it's an accommodation issue or the need for adaptation, is actually overshadowed by the fact that somebody is a gypsy traveller. So it's seen as, oh, that's a gypsy traveller issue or that's the gypsy travellers are the problem. And that actually leads to the real issues being ignored or overlooked. And the second thing that I just wanted to very quickly raise was Scottish Government had an equalities outcome from 2013 to 17. One of the eight equality outcomes was a specific outcome on gypsy travellers, that they would like to see that gypsy travellers experienced less discrimination by 2017. And that was to be welcomed. We're now, the government have just set their new equality outcomes for 2017 to 21, and what we have this time are eight broad themes, and there's very little specific mention of gypsy travellers. And given the lack of progress, I think that's very disappointing and perhaps a missed opportunity, again, to try and um, have a, a robust um, or clearly focused strategy uh, or direction even in place. OK. Thank you. That, that's, that's good to know. Maureen, is there any final comments? Uh, only, only to say, really, that I think um, education is, is, is a, a massive opportunity that's often not tapped into enough in terms of community cohesion, you know, building relationships with the, the families as well. And any consultation that we've ever done that's been successful has always been as an extension of like, the education sort of, um, school community. So I, I think all of these issues, and also I suppose thinking about um, health, a lot of our initiatives have been through um, working with oral health visitors in schools, and they've actually had more um, impact reaching out to communities in um, health education programmes than others have. So I, I just think that the education um, area is, is certainly untapped at the moment in terms of... I, I, I would agree, just from my anecdotal experience of a primary school in my constituency who has, has very good outcomes and very yeah. good community engagement and, you know, parents are on the PTA and, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's a, a real... And, and that there is a transition over to high school as well because they've got mm -hmm. good outcomes in high schools as well. So, so there is an opportunity, you know, where, where there's good practice where we can highlight that. Um, I think we are not finished with this topic, if 
I think you'll realise that. Um, certainly Mary isn't, and, and neither she should be, and I think the committee have uh, got a commitment to keep an eye on this. There's a few recommendations in the evidence that we've heard this morning that I think we'll have a discussion about, about how we take some of that forward. Hopefully uh, we, we, we can do that, and I think the, the intention would be to do that, but we'll come back to you. Can we thank you so much for coming along this morning? We've went well over our time, but we felt it was valuable to, to, to hear as much from you as we possibly could. Um, no doubt we'll, we'll, we'll speak again. Um, so thank you so much for, for coming along this morning. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, I'm going to suspend committee now to go into private session. Thank you so much.